Welcome back, everybody, to the Places We'll Go show. We've got another fabulous episode for you today. Before I go into that, I'm just going to do a tiny little shout out to Sarah Atkins. I was sat next to, so this is going to be a surprise for her. I was sat next to her at dinner last night um, for a Marketing Academy event. Uh, and turns out she was a super fan. I think she's listened to nearly all the episodes. I even made her husband listen to a few. Um, uh, so thank you, Sarah, for being a loyal fan and uh, hopefully you appreciate the shout out. Okay, so back to business. Um, Toby Horry, uh, brilliant to have you on the show. Welcome, Toby. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. Great to be here. Well, so uh, so it is truly fabulous to have you, Toby. I've, I've known you, I think, years and we've met many, many times through different things. Uh, and so let me just explain to everybody who, who you are if they didn't know already. So Toby, you're a global brand and content director of TUI, um, very big travel company. And of course, through your tenure, uh, you, you know, you endured COVID in a travel company. So that in itself is a story, but there's, there's so much more to you than that. So if I if I outline a bit of your career plot. So started your career having graduated from Nottingham Uni. Shout out for Nottingham Uni, fellow graduates. Uh, nice one. Um, and actually started as a production manager in a film company which was a, a, a different start point for many of the people, for many of the people that we've, we've had on the show. Uh, actually moved agency side uh, with AMV BBDO there for five years. So we might find out a little bit about your perspective on the, the two sides of the marketing coin. Uh, then nine years as MD of, of an agency called Dare. Uh, so you've, you've led an agency as well. Um, then, at, then to Tesco for two or three years. And then the last five years at TUI. Um, and as I said, all the way through the pandemic period. Um, there's more. Uh, so you, I think, fairly regularly in the top 100 things, so campaign 100 in 2023 for starters. Um, and also, I, I noticed it, that you had the best brand team uh, in 2022 Marketing Society. That is a top, top award and talks to you as a leader of your team. Uh, and also, I, I did notice you had one of the nation's favorite ads in 2023, according to System One. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll might get into Number that. Nine. Number nine. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, back in the also, uh, two noteworthy things. You're you're a pilot. There you go. I don't think we've ever had a pilot on the show. Show show 156, and you're the first time pilot. Um, and, and also, uh, of course, uh, one thing that connects us is that you are on the Marketing Academy Fellowship this year. It came to the first time we've ever had a current Marketing Academy Fellow. Um, so we're very honoured to have you with us, and, and uh, uh, I know it's going to be a cracker. So thanks for joining us, Toby. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, well, Toby, welcome, welcome. Um, Wow, Paul, I didn't really realize that. But interesting, in the green room, we were talking about you doing a bit, a bit of travel in 2024. I wonder if that's in your own plane or or commercial, but uh, tell us where you've been. Yeah, so uh, this, I mean, I, I am traveling quite a bit more now because I'm in the sort of global role. Um, so this year, I've already um, been fortunate enough. I've been to Sri Lanka. I've been to Germany twice. I've been to Austria and I have been to the Netherlands. So that's... and. Uh, Given it's only what are we mid March, that's um, it's uh, not bad going and plenty good plenty to go. But n- none of my own travel this year. Um, flying yourself around Europe in the middle of winter is um, not quite so much fun. So uh, I tend that tends to be more of a, a fair weather pursuit. I went, I flew myself to Jersey last year. That was uh, that was quite good fun. That's pretty cool. I, I am fascinated on the pilot's license thing. I had a, my first, probably one and only gliding experience the other day. And in five seconds, you get to take control of the, you know, the thing. Uh, and I have to say, I didn't really like it too much. So what, what inspired you to become a pilot? Gliding's scary. You've got no engine. Um, so uh, That's what I thought. <laughs> so, um, when I was at school, um, they had a cadet thing uh, and they had an RAF section of the cadet thing. And I joined that. And then because of that, I discovered that there was this thing called a flying scholarship you could apply for at the time, which was where you would um, get 30 hours of flying training um, via the Air Force. Uh, so I thought I'll apply for that. And I got it. And I actually, when I was in the, the school holidays between um, my sort of two upper six years, so when I was 17, I went to Nottingham and learned to fly with 10 other 17-year-olds. Uh, which, looking back, is um, slightly scary, um, but um, but that that's what we did, and and then I I completed another fifteen hours, I think, to top up to get my license, and that's that's how I got it. So so I think I'd only learned to drive in the March, and by September I had my, my pilot's license. So um, so yeah, quite scary looking back on it in some ways. Um, then when I was at university, I joined the what's called the University Air Squadron, and that's where you get 
trained by it, actually in the RAS environment. So, um, so I did uh, another I think sixty or so hours there, and then I just sort of kept it going. I, I very, I was kind of almost meant to join the Air Force and had an offer as a as a pilot in the Air Force, but I, I decided against it. You had to sign up for sixteen years um, because obviously they want to make sure they're getting, you know, <laughs> the the value of the training out of you. And I think age twenty or twenty one or whatever it was, I, I think I. I think it was the sort of job you need to be 110% absolutely committed to. Um, and so I wasn't, I didn't have quite that level of certainty that that's what I wanted to do. So, so I decided against it. But um, but yeah, I've managed to keep my fly going, keep myself learning and training. And and, um, and what's interesting, I think, about it is that compared to marketing, it's everything's very black and white. Like you make bad decisions or good decisions. In marketing, everything is just shades of grey. Uh, and so I, I think it's quite a nice mental contrast to a lot of the the work that you know we as marketers do all of that. I tell you what, you stole my question there, Toby, in and around some some core lessons and differences. But um, interestingly, I was at a I, I was at a talk just the other day um, with another pilot, and he started a company called Turbulence. Mm-hmm. And the analogy simply being that, of course, you know, being able to navigate turbulence up at thirty five thousand feet versus the way that we do on the ground a lot of the times as we've been through in the last number of years. And in fact, what he revealed about turbulence, I mean, beyond the scary bits when you're up in the sky, is that sometimes, you know, pilots actually have to go through an, a pockets of turbulence to find the smooth ground. Yeah. And, and I just wonder, you know, in that analogy, perhaps there's, there's something in it in and around some of the, the last number of years for you in a travel organization. Yeah, um, and wondered how you could have got through. Yes, I mean, I mean, clearly, COVID working in a travel organisation in COVID was um, suboptimal. I think is is uh, possibly <laughs> one way for it. Yeah, yeah. Putting it. Um, it was. Uh, I mean, I distinctly remember in March 2020, and I remember thinking, "Blimey, this is um, this is quite disruptive. This could, you know, this could be two or three weeks of of disruption." <laughs> And little did I know that literally, I mean, two years later, we were still facing those pockets of, of disruption. Um, I mean, initially, the the it was everyone became a customer service representative in that we, we had to get, I think, over 100,000 people back repatriated into the UK. And in some cases, we had to do it in 48 hours. So I think it was Spain that was going to shut its borders in 48 hours. So we had to fly aircraft out to Spain literally just fill them with as many people as possible and get them home. Now, when we got them home, those people may have flown out of Cardiff, Newcastle, Aberdeen. But of course, we, could, we couldn't, we could you know, do that level of complexity. So we literally just got them back to the UK. And I I, met, I did a shift at Stansted one night with a clipboard where people were coming off a plane and we had fleets of coaches to then take them back to where they actually needed to get to. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so at that, those very early stages, it was very much a... a becoming a customer service operation we all of my team basically stood up as um social media customer service representatives because that's kind of the, i think the volume of contact we normally get something like um one million contacts a year and, and we got four million in something like four weeks it was it was absolutely ridiculous um so so that was very tumultuous but then it became clear that this was we were in for a bit more of the long haul than than we originally thought and what was really hard there was that everything became very short termist. I mean, as marketers, I think you try and have a longer term strategy and a longer term plan. Um, and all those long term plans basically got thrown straight in the dustbin. Um, and even when it came to where we could take people on holiday the following week, we were sat there on a Thursday night waiting for Grant Shapps to tweet what was on the green list next week. And I think customers thought that we knew before they did what this list was going to look like and we didn't we were literally sat there refreshing twitter as well trying to work out where we could take passengers next week and of course the second the tweet came out the phone's ringing off the hook and and we had to sort of you know not fly here and instead fly so it was hugely hugely complicated um and as i said very short termist but um i think what we what we did well was at the same time as having to do all that short term work we did do a lot of work on the long term future of the brand the brand identity the brand strategy um the brand advertising we ran a, a pitch 
you know, completely remote pitch during COVID. Um, so that when COVID finally did, you know, come to an end, um, we were able to be in as good a position as possible. So, so I suppose that's a, it's a very short potted history of how we, how we navigated COVID. So sounds torrid. So when you're so viscerally involved, like literally there with your clipboard and waiting for grant shouts to tweet, um, must, must have changed you in a way as a marketer. What did it? How, and if so, how? I, I think it gave me a stronger appreciation of the short term and the long term. I think it also gave me an appreciate, appreciation of what what teams and companies can do under pressure. I mean, it was an incredible effort from everyone at TUI and in, in the travel sector generally, really, um, because this was totally unprecedented. I think the, the only thing of any any similarity that people pointed to was the, um, the, 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 the volcano that it... Um, erupted in Iceland I think it was in 2011 and it shut skies for I think it was like 11 days 14 days something like that so so, the, so that was the literally the only reference points and that and that in, in comparison now sort of seemed like you know a blip on the um on the distant uh, distant horizon so um so yeah it, it did teach you about resilience it taught you about um you know how to how to change plans quite quite quickly um i think it also demonstrated to a lot of organizations how remote working was um feasible and it's interesting that 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 conversation is still going on now about you know back to office hybrid and not etc so a, a very live conversation but i i definitely don't think that um the world would have moved on so much in terms of hybrid working if it hadn't been for for covid so um, so yeah, it, it, it taught me a huge amount. Um, and, and I think it also taught me to appreciate what I had, um, fundamentally, um, which is always a good lesson. This is true. Um, to be interesting, just before I was doing a bit of research and came across a, a clip from the CEO of NVIDIA and he was talking to a Stanford cohort about the trials and tribulations of what he, what he did and what he achieved. But one fundamental lesson that he said was that um, he wishes upon people that they actually endure a level of pain in a corporate yeah. setting because that's where the finest lessons potentially are learned yeah. because yeah. that's where success comes from a level of perseverance in his point of view over necessarily intelligence. And and I wonder through that process, maybe you know some of these things that we have gone through help us to build our levels of resilience um, I wonder if maybe there's something you could talk to in and around that, because I don't see many more corporate environments that are as unsettling as the one that you've gone through. And I wondered if there is something that you've lessons learned in and around how you can stick at things. And even personally, by the way, there must have been a hugely uncertain time and moment for you sitting yeah. in that in that uh, in that environment. So you're balancing out customer uncertainty and business uncertainty with your own personal uncertainty at that moment, yeah. I'm sure as well. Yeah, I mean. I, I completely agree. And I think um, you do, and I, I think I've now reached that point in my career where I now understand that you do learn more through adversity than you do through success. Um, and and it, I even sort of think about it in relation to my children and, um, you know, they're, they're 17 and 20. And, uh, you know, the, the parental instinct is to, you know, make sure bad things don't happen to your children. That is the sort of fundamental thing. But then sometimes... You go well, but if nothing bad ever happens, then then do the you know, do they build those levels of resilience and adversity? And I think it's the same at work. I think now I, um, you know, in the old days you might think, oh my god, that you know that meeting was terrible or something terrible happened or what a disaster. Um, I I try now to think, you know, even when you do, you know, and everyone has bad meetings and things go badly, but you always try to think about those as code. Well, okay, so what does that mean? What next? And I think that that is actually kind of my my nature i tend to be kind of quite adaptive and, and kind of rather than sort of wallow in the things that have gone wrong is go okay but what do we how do we fix this going forward um which is you know personally i find that uh better probably for mental health as well it's like you know not rather than wallowing in the in the terrible things <laughs> i love that yeah what what next great great um the, the uh, So we've talked a little bit about some of the things that have shaped you in the more recent history. And then, of course, we heard about 
at the age of 17 and flying. But um, we haven't really got to, well, how did you actually get into marketing? So yeah. how did you move from, you know, production manager in a film company to agency? And then, you know, what was the draw into the world of marketing and agency? I, I mean, I probably should go back even further. So my father was a creative in advertising agencies in the 70s and 80s. And he worked at an agency called CDP, um, which at the time was, um, I think, considered to be the, be the one of the best, if not the best, agency. And they did some incredible work. and And for anyone listening, I mean, I, I definitely recommend to go back and watch some of the work from that time. So whether that be Hamlet or Fiat Strada or Heineken, um, those those wow. sorts of um, campaigns. So so I sort of grew up in a in a sort of advertising environment. Um, and I even remember, you know, age five going, you know, going into the office, you know, a couple of days and on 110 Euston Road and thinking, this is quite good. This is seems like quite a fun industry to work in. Uh, um, I mean, it was the 70s. He was a creative. So that, I mean, the, I think some of the rules they had was was no, um, no playing pool before 11 o'clock. Um, and the other unwritten rules seem to be that once you went for lunch, you never came back. Um but uh, so I think the world has moved on quite a lot from that. Um, but so I so I sort of grew up in this um, this environment. But I lived in rural Cambridgeshire, so I lived in a very small village. So, and I I basically had uh, one of those school holidays where I could either ride my bike around the village for for six weeks or do something less boring instead. So I I wrote to a guy called Paul Wayland, who was a director who um, who used to work with my father, and basically said, "Can I come and he ran a film production company and I said can I come and make the tea and you know do the photocopying and, and he was like yep so so off I went and uh and I think he was on day two or day three he said all oh, right we're filming um, Mr Bean this week so uh, you're coming on the shoot so so within my first week I was my, my job was basically getting Rowan Atkins and his lunch um uh and so I'm, and I'm I think I was 15 at this point and of course then you go back to school it's like what did you do in your whole life? oh you know just hung out at Rowan Atkinson got him his lunch all sounds quite. I mean, it was utterly knackering because you had to be there at like four o'clock in the morning, and you were there till you know ten o'clock at night or whatever. You know, you were first in, last out. But um, it was an amazing experience, and 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 then I started to make my own connections in in the film production world. And I basically every time I had a school holiday or a university holiday, I would I would go and work and and just as a way of earning cash. And I also did a year working in Australia in between school and university for a film production company out there, um, which was <clears throat> amazing. Again, worked really hard, but all, at the same time felt like I was always on holiday um, because, you know, you're, you're in Sydney and it's it's amazing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so I did that through school, through university, did it two, <clears throat> excuse me, two years out of university. And it was only at that point that I realised that whilst the production side of things looked quite sexy and interesting a lot of the stuff i was quite fascinated with was stuff that had happened you know way before we got anywhere near a shoot so much more the strategic side kind of why we're doing what we're doing i mean i did i did history at university so i i guess that sort of some parallels of sort of analytics and, and kind of why things happen um so so that was the point at which i decided i needed to have you know pursue a slightly different path and that's when I um, decided I needed to become a planner in an advertising agency and I pursued all these paths to become a planner and I actually managed to get um, a job at Abbott Mead on their grad recruitment scheme so they, they hired two planners that year there was me and Sarah Tate um, who you might know um, and so we were the baby planners at Abbott Mead um, in 2020 no 20, 2002 I think yeah that's when we started um so yeah, so that that was kind of the early part of my career and how I went from sort of production to um, to, to advertising agency. Yeah. I, I tell you, fascinating and what a what a wonderful sort of you know way into our industry at Abbott Mead. I mean, doesn't get much better when in in many respects. Um, really? What I find is um, what I find fascinating. It, it almost feels like there's two facets to you there, Toby. On the one hand, it seems like you're quite the adventurer, right? So RAF pilot flying in the skies as well as going down a, a less orthodox sort of route when it comes to trying to seek out new experiences, job experiences, production mm -hmm. seemed like a little bit more left field than a boring paper round, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And yet on the other hand, 
you know, you're then starting to go in a far more structured direction in and yeah. around that strategic aspect, the planning aspect of things. Um, but actually, my question relates to the the role in which you go after unorthodox, um, maybe more adventurous type of experiences and maybe what that helps you to then maybe do your job better. Maybe that's why you're on travel through and through in that respect. Yeah. Um, but do you recommend, do you think about the fact that you're trying, you're on more on the adventurous side, which has led you to um, get more enhancements in your career, maybe more growth? Um, it's interesting you say that because I think actually fundamentally I'm quite risk averse. And I think actually probably most pilots are pretty risk averse as well. Um, so so I think deep down in my nature, I, I, I don't think I'm necessarily a risk taker. But having said that, what I do really appreciate is is getting new and different experiences. I feel like every experience you have, negative, positive, you know, whatever it might be, adds to your to your learning and to your your bank of knowledge. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I I love new experiences. I said, I you know went to Sri Lanka on a shoot early this year. Just loved, you know, I'd never been there. Fascinating place, really incredible, really lovely people, um, and. Uh, so, so I do. I do think that exposing yourself to different experiences is really important, um, and particularly earlier on in your career, because I think it's really hard when you're when you're young and you're trying to sort of set out and you're sort of expected to know what you want to do for the rest of your life, um, which is pretty unrealistic, really. Um, so, actually, I think that probably the most important thing is to try and have a number of different experiences as much so you know what you don't want to do as to what you do want to do um so so yeah so i i do try and make sure i'm, I'm having different experiences I, I kind of like to go to different places on holiday you know eat different foods so you know i, I think that's a it's an important part of growing as a person i think um toby you cut you come across as very grounded and people i know who know you say you are and you're you're a great leader and but you also it's evident you know you're keen on new experiences and learning yeah. so you're on the marketing academy fellowship year which is this intensive potentially cmo to ceo program so i'm interested to know what 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 are you learning about yourself at the moment um so we've only just started actually so we've had the first offsite um in february uh, january sorry um and i think there's a few things. I mean, this um, the, the way the course works is kind of is kind of two components. One is actually about learning the language and the skills, the functional skills about that sort of CMO to CEO journey. So, you know, we're, we're having you know lectures from McKinsey on corporate finance and and sort of that side of things. But I think um, probably the the almost the more important side is learning about who you are and what makes you happy and what you want to do um and i think probably most people's career often they get to the point where they're they're just sort of they're going where the road takes them rather than necessarily making conscious choices about what they want to do and i think it's um i think it's a course which really helps you analyze what is it that you enjoy about what you do now what is it that you don't enjoy what is it what do you want to be doing in five years time what would it take to get there what skills do you need to to learn? And it, and that could be, you know, it doesn't have to be just career things. It could be, you know, you want to go live somewhere else, or there's, there's something that you want to achieve that you've never achieved. So, so I think um, it's one of those programs that really helps you focus on you as an individual and kind of what you what you want to get out of the next, you know, ten years of your life. And it's funny because in, in normal day to day life, I, I mean, I certainly feel you don't almost have the, the time and the headspace to be able to do that. So, it, so it's a real privilege to be able to be on the course and the program, um, to be able to have that that time to reflect. And I suppose the last thing is that it's with a group of 20 or so other amazing, you know, CMO level uh, marketers uh, at this incredible network. And, and already, we, you know, we've, uh, they've been so um, kind to sort of give me advice on particular things i'm looking at at work and so it's it's an amazing uh networking thing as well so, yeah. well hey it does sound like quite the uh quite the privilege to be able to to carve out that time to really ask some of those big questions in in your life professional and personal yeah toby you're probably um you know in a in a fairly unique position in that being able to understand some of the core trends particularly in the travel industry 
uh, that are taking shape and have been taking shape over the last number of years. Clearly, lots of change amidst. And I and I'm intrigued as to your perspective on maybe some of the key changes or trends that you're seeing across travel and how people are traveling more. Yeah, I mean <laughs> that. What's interesting is actually a lot stays the same in travel. You know, there are quite a lot of people who who very clearly want a very similar holiday experience whenever they go. I mean, there are, there are some people who will literally go to the same hotel for, you know, 15, 20 years every year because they've, they've found what they love and they, and they enjoy it. And, that, and that's, that's great. You know, if you, you found something like that, that's incredible. Um, and, I, and I think you, you do see a, a sort of demographic shift, I think, um, to, to the younger end of the, the spectrum. And I guess that's basically people who've grown up in the world of more componentized travel. So, you know, getting on a flight, you know, getting a hotel from a um, sort of aggregator website. Um, and so maybe people who uh, haven't, you know, sort of grown up in the world of, of package holidays so much. Um, but there's also, I think what COVID did was um, got people to reassess what a package holiday is. I think sometimes people think, you know, package holidays are, you know, something from a carry-on tour in the 70s. Um, but actually, it's, it, all it is is when you literally stick two components of a holiday together, so a, a flight and a hotel. Now, well, that that could be anything, right? So, and that I think what people don't necessarily understand about companies like TUI is the breadth of holidays that we offer. So everything from, you know, long haul to short haul to river cruises and cruises and ski and lakes and mountains and so so there's there's all sorts of things you can do and they are all a package holiday right so um so going to vietnam and, and touring around for, for three weeks is a package holiday as much as going to you know ibiza and, and staying in a, in a hotel for a week is a package holiday so so i think there's a bit of um reframing as to what package is and, and interesting because when you book a package holiday you're protected if a covid um sort of put package back into the the um the spotlight a little bit in terms of what people understood about holidays and that sort of thing so um so yeah but i think i think the fundamental um thing that does remain the same is this um the importance of holidays and leisure more broadly in your fundamental levels of happiness and i think people um you know particularly in you know we talk about cost of living and recession and things like that you know people are very keen to do everything they can to try and protect their holiday, their summer holiday, um, because I think a lot of people recognise the importance it has um, for their well-being and for their, you know, their family's well-being or whoever they're with. Um, and I think also holidays are the things that you look back on, right? So I can't particularly remember what I did in 2016, but I could probably remember where we went on holiday, and that's the bit of the year that that sticks out. So. Um, so they're almost like these little firework moments in people's lives that uh, that you look back on. Um, I mean, one piece of one last story is that I'm, I'm, I make a, one of these photo box um, calendars at Christmas of my mum and stuff. And um, and what I realised every year I did it was eighty percent of the pictures in it were from the, from my holiday because <laughs> it was the time when we actually relaxed and remembered to take pictures and uh, and that sort of thing. So um, so I think that's what stays the same is that that um, that holidays are. Of fundamental importance of how people you know feel what what a lovely framing that we you know <clears throat> we create the fri the firework moments in people's lives and mm. you're so right if i look back at all the photos you know you delete mm. many what's left is is off from the holidays and that's how you sort of frame your folders um and and so we've had two different aspects of happiness the the happiness that holidays create and then you talked about on the learning journey you're on now what makes you happy mm -hmm. uh, to me that the dot 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 is to talk a little bit about purpose because yep. you know what makes you happy why you're here who you are is all in that space so how, how do you at a personal level how do you think about that per the purpose conversation do you mean more than personal purpose yeah yeah i mean i i, I think um <laughs> broadly speaking i think you you only get put on this world once and therefore you you, sh you should you know, as best as you can be happy right so you should seek the things out that make you happy um and i've been extremely lucky in that regard my, my, my family and my, my work are, you know as ever like everyone there's ups and downs but i've been very very lucky in that, that you know i've managed to find the things that um 
that that made me happy. And I think um, I, d- I do try and also look to to balance to try and make sure we've got that that happiness. I mean, um, everyone in wa- marketing works very hard. Everyone at Tui works very hard. I think it's important to have the the times when you're not working quite so hard because actually that makes you a better person and a better leader and a better marketer. So even things like, you know, uh, if you've been on Teams calls all day, I, one of the things I love in the evening is cooking. I just, and it, again, purely because it's something quite different and it's just, you can you can just be with yourself, you can just cook. Uh, there's no one telling you what to do. Uh, so I find that massively therapeutic. So I, I think having these, I mean, you sort of a lot of yin and yangs in your life, I think is quite important. And I, it makes me glad that I, you know, didn't become a sort of investment banker and, and, uh, and go that approach because, you know, some of the stories you hear about sort of, you know, being in the office at six or maybe having slept in the office and, and then staying overnight and staying till, t- I mean, it just, it just doesn't feel like the sort of existence that would fundamentally make me happy. So, so I do think that having that balance, um, is, is really important. Toby, I think, um, you know, a lot of people were able to resonate with that, and and certainly, as you say, you know, having a having something a bit of downtime to be able to rejuvenate and cooking is is your release, which is just mm-hmm. great. Um, what's your what's your favorite cuisine? <laughs> uh, probably Italian because of the b- diversity and breadth of it. You know, I mean, if you go back, what was it 150 years when Italy was like, actually like 12 countries? Each of them with their own cuisine. I think you can get so much breadth and diversity um, from from food in Italy. So that's probably the that's probably my go to. Yeah, I'm trying to eat a bit less pasta these days. Um, I love it. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna that, that was a cheeky question there, but um, I want to I want to come back to something that you you talked about in in during the the likes of COVID, and you said that the company in everybody in the company became a customer service agent. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I think it's great. You know, everyone digging in together. And and I wonder um, if there's any sort of lessons that you took from that experience and maybe standing at Stansted and, and how that influenced your approach to marketing. Clearly, we always have a bit more of a zoomed out effect when we think about marketing and planning versus standing in the cold face of clipboard and Stansted. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it really brought home a lot of the stuff that that we know about you know, the long and the short of it and that sort of thing and about having that short-term view and that long-term view. But I think COVID really brought that into sharp focus. It was like the shortest-term view that you can possibly have. But even even when that was happening, I was very clear that we needed to also be thinking about the long-term. Um, and that's why we did, you know, run an agency pitch. We, we um, you know, completely redid our, our, our brand strategy and our brand identity um, and we didn't actually launch it till October 21, I believe. Um, but we'd spent that, you know, the, the real dark days of COVID making sure that we were going to be ready. So so I think it, it, as I say, just brought into really sharp focus this sort of need for a marketer to be able to go super short term, but also have that long term perspective I and mean, that sort of zooming in, zooming out thing. Um, so I, I think that's the that's the key thing it, it, it brought into focus for me. Yeah. So if we t- if we step out to take a bit more of a macro view, there's there's a heck of a lot going on in marketing at the moment. Yeah. You know the the drive for data and personalization and yeah. uh, fast changing media landscape. Now some advertisers are spending more on social than on TV. You wouldn't have thought that five years ago. The the, the rise and rise of generative AI. So so many things to contend with. What's what's your perspective on the, the the key things that are driving marketing right now? Um, I think, I mean, as you said, there there is a lot going on. I, I do think that um, addressability is an opportunity and a threat. Um, I mean, I, I talked about you know advertising in the seventies. Um, one of the ads that they did at CDP was Fiat Strada, hand built by robots, and it, and it won lots of awards, and it was quite famous at the time, but. The thing that probably maybe people don't know about it is I th- I'm pretty certain that they basically bought the news at 10, um, uh, the middle of the news at 10 slot for five days uh, for one week. And by doing that, they reached over half the population uh, in one week, right? It's just not possible to do that these days. 
Um, and I think that's a that's a massive problem. The ability to to spend money to create these sort of moments in time. I mean, probably the closest thing we've got to it is you know the Super Bowl in America, and to maybe a slightly lesser extent Christmas in the UK, uh, which does become a bit of a advertising moment. But the ability to to get more than half the population to even see you uh, is is nigh on impossible these days, uh, or certainly a lot more complicated than it used to be. Having said that, you know, addressability is a massive opportunity as well. So, and I'm not necessarily talking about one-to-one, which is, you know, obviously there is a role for that. But I guess if you're talking about one-to-many, you know, big cohorts of people who you know that you, you want to get in front of, um, and your ability to actually find and target those people is a really interesting opportunity. Um, so in the absence of being able to to get that sort of mass reach nowadays, you know, what's the, what does addressability um, provide an opportunity to find the right people that you need to speak to? And I don't necessarily mean people in market night right now. And that's an interesting thing about travel is that most people are not buying a holiday most of the time. True. Um, a bit like cars, I suppose. So, so it's actually how do you maintain that level of um, top of mind awareness so that when someone does come into the market, uh, you're able to make sure that um, you know you're you're on the list that they're they're gonna going to um, go to. So yeah, so I think addressability is going to become an opportunity threat, and I think um, you may even see a, at the moment it feels like when you see a media plan that <laughs> the, the the bottom axis is usually time, and you wonder whether you're going to now just start seeing media plans where the bottom axis is the customer. And actually, is that that might be a good thing? Um, you know, we'd be being more customer centric in the way that you you, you plan your media um, with the tools to be able to do it is is clearly an opportunity. But as I say, I do lament the the how hard it is now to get in front of significant numbers of people uh, at scale in one go. I think that's a really lovely sort of little naughty challenge to to hang our hats on. And I and I absolutely agree with you. By the way, that it's. It's how do you how do you achieve that in a very very fragmented world mm. and, and, and pace and space? Yeah, Toby, we've come to the end of the segment here, and it's been truly wonderful talking to you on, on so many different levels. And I perhaps just want to pick up as a last question, in and around, you know, you talked a lot about your experience getting kicked off at the alumni academy and asking some of those big questions mm-hmm. and giving yourself the time and space to do so. So when when looking forward, um, where do you see some of your you know your your kind of aspiration going to? Do you feel like you have a bit of a planned trajectory or a bit of a TBC moment? Um, I think I'm I think I'm still trying to work it out. I mean, I'm really enjoying uh, where I am at the moment. Moment, I'm very fortunate. Um, uh, I, I now report directly to the CEO, um, which has given me a different exposure and um, and you know different experiences, and so that's really great. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm uh, I'm I'm really happy at the moment, and I think there's a lot of work that we're doing at the moment, which is really interesting. You know, for the next year, two years, three years, um, I think the bit that I'm less clear on is kind of you know, <laughs> where do I want to be in my late fifties? What do I want to be doing? And I guess that's the bit um, uh, that I you know, being on the the uh, Academy Fellowship is something to help me work out. Um, not that I have to make any rash decisions right now, but. Uh, but it'd be nice to have that understanding of where I want to be. I mean, my my kids are say seventeen and twenty, so they're they're probably going to be. Well, I say they're going to be shipping out. I don't know if they are actually. They'll probably, <laughs> they'll probably be still there in the yeah. fifty as well. But um, so 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 yeah. So I'm I'm less clear on on that. But um, I mean, I I just feel like travel is an amazing sector to work in. You know, so many different experiences, um, and marketing within travel, I think, is almost even better. Uh, because you're sort of marketing happiness, which is, um, I think, a pretty great business to be in. So, um, so yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm in a pretty good place at the moment. I think. Yeah, I bet, I bet you are, Toby. It's, um, it sounds, sounds fabulous. You know, anybody who gets the opportunity to to market happiness must be in a must be in a good good space. But even beyond that, I, like as Mark mentioned, I love that notion of the, you know, being able to be a part of someone's fireworks moments mm-hmm. and thinking about photos and perhaps in a virtual platform these days, but, um, you know, the vast majority of them is, as you say, you know, um, savored for those few moments in the year and you play a pivotal role in that. So that must be, 
wonderfully satisfying to know that you know you really do play a part in someone's someone's happiness. Um, Toby, thank you. It's been an illuminating conversation, and there's so many lovely golden nuggets to, to take away from this. And I'm going to try and maybe pull out just some of those key themes uh, as we as we close this the session. Clearly, starting off, I love the I love the irony of starting off talking about the world of flying, and just so hand in glove with where you are at and where you work at the moment, of course. And I think that's that's wonderful. Um, but lots of lots of lessons learned, right? When thinking about the world of flying and cadets and the RAF and decisions, even in your early stages of your career, whether to work in that sort of very structured environment versus, as you put it, marketing is a bit more gray than what you would say in, in the world of, of the forces or indeed aviation. Um, but of course, disruption has certainly been around the corner and it's an industry that is turbulent, forgive the pun. Um, and COVID was, was probably the ultimate reckoning of that you said you know you thought it'd be a two to three week disruption Um, and uh, you know it came out to be what of course was a number of years but it talks to the testament actually when we think about you know getting down right to the nuts and bolts and short termism of being a customer service agent versus having the the headspace or having the strategic thought process of seeing a longer a longer way seeing the, the the balance of short and long and, and interestingly, for all those who, who don't realize, but, and Toby very humbly didn't mention, but that brand campaign that was created in COVID actually gone on to win many, many awards and, and done exceptionally well. So actually, you know, seeing the longer term view in, in what sometimes is a tenuptious situation um, can really differentiate you and make you stand out from the crowd. And I think that's, that's one of those key, sort of key lessons. Um, I think that also talks to testament about your leadership style. You know, when you talk about making and, play, and being placing and, and changing and being adaptable and making plans um, and then being able to kind of work your way through. And interestingly, you know, you talked about this in the context of your own kids and advice you would give them, but also more in, you know, when you have a bad day at the office, so to speak, and talked about the adaptability. And it's not so much about being anxious about a bad meeting. It's about actually, guys, come on, how do we move forward from here? Mm-hmm. And that you know, beyond actually being more productive from a strategic perspective also has some good um, you know, good favors on your mental health too, which I think is a really nice piece of, you know, a dual benefit, shall we say. Um, we've spoken a little bit in the past uh, on, on train journeys up and down from Oxford, if, you're, if you recall. Yeah. And uh, you talked of your father and, yeah. uh, and sort of the influence. And I kind of, it was, it was fairly evident about the influence that he's had as to where you've decided to join in, into our industry and the remarkable career that your dad actually did have and some of the really iconic advertising that he did create. So I really recommend people to to look look that up. Um, in fact, I think you did a lovely, lovely article on some of his his core teachings and his core adverts that um, that he did throughout the years, which I've read and really enjoyed and I've, I've watched a multitude of his campaigns since. So it's been really impactful for me as well. So thank you for sharing that back in the day. Um, I hope you're still in touch with Rowan Atkinson. I don't know, maybe he will remember you. <laughs> he never writes, he never calls. I mean, geez. <laughs> That's it. Why not? Why not? But it's it's lovely to see that sometimes, you know, you take the unconventional route um, and that leads you just to have greater experiences and exposures. A risk-averse man who actually has lots of exposures um, and, and really values a, a diverse range of experiences, which you could then bring into your own environment. And actually, I suspect as part of your secret source that makes you all the better in your career. You know, we talked a bit about travel and the changing nature of that, but um, and the happiness that you, you you garner in people's lives as a consequence. And then very much ending the segment around your personal purpose, you know, you seek to do things that make you happy, gaining a balance and uh, making sure that you've got a few things outside of work as well. I think that's really, really at the core of things. Um, and you know, uh, big questions to be answered and asked, both in your career and your, you know, the way that you see about how things move forward. But right now, you're in a great space. And above all, you're creating happiness. And I think that's just such a wonderful place to be. So thank you, Toby. It's really been a wonderful conversation and uh, really appreciated your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been great. Thanks, Toby. Thank you.